Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to welcome you all on behalf of SETA Brussels office uh, to this important event. Uh, tonight we are going to discuss the current conflict in the Nagorno-Karabakh region of the Azerbaijan. As you know, the Nagorno-Karabakh was occupied um, in the 90s by Azer uh, Armenia. And since then it is occupied and uh, since then there was a fragile ceasefire uh, in the region uh, that was now and then um, some uh, skirmishes between the uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia. But in the last month, um, we have uh, a new uh, conflict started in the region and we haven't witnessed this kind of uh, conflict in the region uh, in the last uh, 26 years. Uh, and uh, today we have three distinguished ambassadors with us and we are going to discuss uh, the current situation in the Nagorno-Karabakh and also we are going to discuss possible um, diplomatic uh, solution uh, to the conflict and if also it is still possible a diplomatic solution uh, in, the, in, the, in the region. Uh, as I have mentioned, we have three distinguished speakers with us. We have Fuat Iskandarov, uh, uh, His Excellency Fuat Iskandarov, Ambassador of Azerbaijan to Belgium and the head of the mission of the Republic of Azerbaijan to the European Union. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, Matthew Breiser, retired uh, His Excellency, uh, Matthew Breiser, retired ambassador uh, um, uh, from United States. And also we have Yonet Can Tezel, His Excellency, ambassador yes. and director general for the Eurasia, Turkish for, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. So uh, as you see, we have three uh, um, ambassadors and one uh, retired ambassador and they are uh, skilled uh, and uh, experienced diplomats uh, and, uh, and we are going to discuss today the Nagorno-Karabakh issue. I would like to start with uh, Mr. Uh, his, uh, ambassador uh, Fat Iskandarov. Uh, since you are representing Azerbaijan, um, I would like to uh, ask you about your opinion. Uh, I mean, the, there were, as I mentioned, skirmishes between two sides in the last 26 years, but so far this is the, this is the most serious, uh, I mean, uh, conflict that we are seeing in the region in the last 26 years. Why do you think it has started now? What was the reason, uh, do you think, behind this uh, current uh, situation? And do you think also still a possible, I mean, a, a solution, to, a diplomatic solution to the problem is still possible or uh, the po solution will be uh, more uh, mili uh, by military means? So what is your, uh, let's say, analysis of the uh, current situation? Uh, thank you so much. First of all, I welcome everybody in this, uh, in this webinar. And of course, I would like to express my appreciations to SETA for this opportunity. Uh, of course, uh, the question which you raise now, it is uh, really very crucial because you, but you have a, the answer on this question, 26 years, uh, 26 years, we do not have uh, any solution in the framework of the uh, MIS group co-chairs. It's good, we, we understand that they did work a lot, but uh, they did create uh, some kind of basic principles and we, we were ready to accept them. But unfortunately, any, every time when we approach to the solution, something happened, something happened. Unfortunately, in last uh, years, we didn't see any indication of the wish to, to find the solution of the problem from Armenian side. Moreover, we did have a, some kind of always provocations from uh, Armenian side to, you know, some kind of the, for example, the statement that Karabakh is Armenia, and that's all. And then some kind of the, you know, attempts to change the format, current format of the uh, negotiations, trying to invite some kind of the, to this negotiation process, uh, occupational regime, you know, in Nagorno-Karabakh. So many. But in, the, in July, we saw the real attempt to destroy everything. It was attack on our border in hundreds of kilometers from, uh, the, from, from, from Karabakh region. Uh, it was really strange and was really sudden for us because it happened on the border. And uh, of course, we, we reacted appropriately. There was no step back from our borders. 
And uh, of course, uh, you know, in four days we managed to keep the borderline. But imagine it was not, it, we did it in case, in, in, you know, without any attack, because we can't attack, because in this case it will be assessed as some kind of penetration to the territory of the country, which is a member of the military union, another military union where we're not, not a member. And then, you know, in August, on 23rd of August, special group of Diversan, they penetrated our territory, they've been arrested and the leader of uh, this group arrested and they penetrated uh, you know just again on the in the region where all the connectivity lines uh, energy pipelines uh, railways motorways they are crossing this area again too far from uh, too far from uh, conflict area and then in september in one day 11 civilians have been killed by you know uh, attacks, artillery attacks of Armenian side. Of course, we responded appropriately, and now we do have what we have. the The situation is uh, going, uh, you know, in uh, you know, in the way of uh, some kind of deoccupation of our territories. Both sides, of course, would like to have a peace, but would like to have a peace and our territories back. That's that's absolutely clear. And of course, uh, now I don't want to go to the details of the military clashes, but just inform you that you know about the two attacks, missile attacks on second city of Azerbaijan with 500,000 of people, Ganja, and uh, that's, the last one happened just immediately, again, immediately after ceasefire uh, ideas of, uh, you know, provided by President Macron. The first one, immediately after the ceasefire idea, uh, humanitarian ceasefire idea provided by uh, Russian Federation. And as, as a result, we have uh, 61 casualties, uh, killed, uh, killed civilians, 20, 282 uh, injured civilians, 1,846 houses destroyed, uh, you know, nine multi uh, apartments, residential buildings, and uh, th three, more than 300 uh, city uh, facilities damaged. Our territory became as a Stalingrad now. Ganja, you know, you saw the, the pictures and you know everything about it. But, you know, we never react on the, on the same way. We, our reaction uh, was on the, on the battlefield. I would like also to inform you that it's crucial to understand that uh, from, uh, you know, uh, Azerbaijan never react on such kind of terrorist, vandalist attacks by some, the same uh, approach as it was provided. Uh, maybe, maybe you heard, for example, about so many terrorist attacks happened on our territory, but never heard about any terrorist attack provided by Azerbaijani side on the territory of Armenia. We never did it. It's not our approach. If we are going, uh, you know, we'd like to achieve our goals, we are going on the battlefield, on the military battlefield, and that's all. Of course, we'd like to express our, uh, our gratitude, our thanks to our strategic brotherhood countries, first of all to Turkey, for the very strong political support of my country. It's crucial for us. It is crucial. Of course, to other countries, to Turkish Council, to, to Pakistan, to Organization for Islamic Cooperation, and for uh, non-alignment movement, where we have a presence now. So, if you speak, you know, globally, uh, you know, everybody, you know, a lot of countries in the world, they understand the situation, and they understand that it's, you know, in which direction we are going. And now, a lot of other countries, they understand that that tectonic shifts in the region. And it is not a story just about the, some kind of local conflict, local war. But our behavior is absolutely clear and without any hidden elements. Uh, you know, the, the, the so leader of Armenia did call to different leaders all over the world. Uh, you know, was uh, you know screaming, crying about about the situation. So many, you know, so many. You know, uh, uh, persons, leaders in the world have been 
disturbed by his calls. Just you know, one can to five a leader one five times, another one four times, and you know it is some. But my president didn't call to anyone except our traditional strategic partners, in neighboring countries, one time. That's all. From this point of view, of course, uh, this political support encourages us to go to the political solution of the problem. But the political solution of the problem is absolutely clear. It's a, you know, uh, basic principles. It means liberalization of the of our occupy, you know, now occupied territories. Uh, you know, the, the you know, withdrawing the troops from all the uh, all the uh, districts of Azerbaijan, and then returning of refugees, internal displayed persons. And then, of course, going to some kind of the opening communications between the countries. Everybody is speaking about, for example, Latching Corridor, but it's not, it's not a story about Latching Corridor. It's a story about the opening the communication between Azerbaijan, Armenia, between the, the, the between different, different, you know, uh, but it's, of course, it's perspective approach, but generally we would like to have it. As a, you know, ambassador to European Union, of course, I would like to use this model of Europe in this particular case. Imagine Europe has a, a two world wars on the territory, on, on, on its territory, with millions of killed people, with huge confrontation between different countries and nations. Yeah, but in the end of the day, they managed to have some kind of model of, uh, of a peace model. What, what happened? They recognized their all, all the member states of uh, EU recognized the territorial integrity of each other and then forgot about the borders. And now everything is open for them. They are working, uh, they, they did create, of course, it's a huge criti uh, critical uh, messages to European Union now uh, because of some kind of problematic issues. But generally, uh, if not starting from the Helsinki final act, uh, you know the impact for uh, for more active political, economical, and social integration of Europe, Europe uh, has been uh, given, and that's why I think that this model is uh, is good because Helsinki Final Act clearly put on the table the the the, the unbelievability of international recognized borders, and then European Union did accept it. European Union members, that I mean and then forgot about the borders. If the countries as European Union member states, they can make it happen, why we can't do it? Azerbaijan, already we are working in this direction with our Georgian friends. Practically speaking, very successful working. And a lot of uh, participants of the webinar, they know it. Uh, we have uh, strategic relations with other uh, neighboring countries. Of course, first of all, brotherhood, strategic, cooperation with Turkey. We have a normal uh, relations, neighboring relations with Russia, with Iran. We never did create any problematic headache, headache problematic issues for our European friends in case of our relations with our neighboring partners. Practically speaking, so many other members of Eastern Partnership we do have in our, uh, you know, among, uh, you know, in, in the six countries, but they always had some kind of problematic issues but we generally always try to unify, uni, un, unite, I'm sorry, unite uh, not uh, all the European uh, member states and Eastern Partnership countries. Imagine just by providing the Southern Gas Corridor, we did create 5,000 new working places for Greece. And it's a real investment to, uh, to European uh, Union. And you know how, how is Azerbaijan economically is one of the engines of Eastern Partnership. There is no any other uh, multilateral project in Eastern Partnership except, except uh, the connectivity project led by Azerbaijan and energy project led by Azerbaijan. That's why I would like uh, to express my hope that we will find the political solution of the problem. Of course, based on the, uh, on the basis principles, uh, and of course, all the world are finishing with it, and we will find it in. And, and the European model could be very attractive for us, not only 
now, but also after. Because the peace is not only the, the document, it's a, some kind of the development, reconstruction. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, for your contribution. Uh, now I would like to give the floor to uh, His Excellency, Mr. Ambassador, um, um, uh, Mr. Uh, um, um, Mr. Ambassador, um, I would like to ask you about Turkey's position. As we have also heard uh, from uh, Mr. Ambassador that Turkey and Azerbaijan has strategic partnership to brotherly countries. Uh, what What is Turkey's position in this uh, conflict? I mean, we know that because of the occupation of Nagorno-Karabakh, Turkey's border to Armenia is closed. And uh, also because of this situation, Armenian and Azerbaijan relations are, uh, uh, I mean, broken. Uh, Mr. Ambassador has mentioned that uh, if there is a solution and if Europeans uh, uh, have achieved the peace after two world wars, why cannot uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan and Turkey cannot achieve this? And I, as far as I see, uh, the current Prime Minister of Armenia, Mr. Pashinyan, um, he wants to open the country the, to the West, but the, the, the steps he has taken uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh is further escalating the conflict, and uh, it's it's not the uh, the direction I think he wants to. Uh, I mean, why the, the, the Armenia has in the first place attacked the Toz region in in July, and we know this area is quite strategic for Turkey. All the pipelines and the, and the railway lines uh, going through this uh, uh, city and then to Georgia and to Turkey. I mean, how do you analyze the current uh, uh, situation, and why, why, what do you think is the, the poss possible solution to this problem? And if there, there is any, any possible solution, uh, diplomatic one, do you think? Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank, you. Uh, thank you for the invitation yeah. and for the panel, um, and a good set of questions. Um, let me start by saying that our position is quite similar to what the Azerbaijani ambassador explained uh, for very obvious reasons. Coincidentally, I was at the OSCE as a much younger Turkish diplomat uh, between 92 and 95. So I was there when the, um, the clashes had started, the Armenian forces had attacked. I was there when the Minsk group was established and the co-chairs uh, and when the very important United Nations Security Council decision resolution adopted. So personally, I've been following this issue for a while, and now I'm also in charge of this file. Um, we very much empathize with um, Azerbaijan, um, not only because we have very special bonds uh, with Azerbaijan, cultural kinship, um, kinship, our closeness, and the historical uh, affinity, cultural affinity, ethnic affinity, but on top of that, we are supporting uh, Azerbaijan's position because we feel they are the wronged party. Uh, they are the legally damaged party in terms of international law and also morally. Uh, we think they have the uh, higher uh, ground. Uh, so um, uh, when we look at the past 28 years and remember the decisions which are supposed to reflect the position, the will of the international community, the fact that they have not been fulfilled, uh, I think demonstrates in this sense um, a failure of the international system which we should now work to remedy. Um, I remember the long nights in those early 90s in Vienna and Budapest and elsewhere in Prague when um, delegations had come close on several occasions to a solution. Uh, news would arrive from the field that uh, the Armenian forces had advanced again, which was very frustrating. The thing is, I don't want to bore you with the history, however, uh, after the end of the Cold War, we all believed we could set up a, a more viable, a more peaceful, less tense environment. And uh, it, in those early 90s, um, we were trying to set up a rules-based international system, especially in this Eurasian or the European um, uh, geography, so to say. And the, the occupation of uh, Karabakh and the uh, adjacent regions was one of the first violations of that uh, goodwill effort. 
The problem is that it still continues. And that's why we understand the um, disappointment of uh, Azerbaijan. Why? Well, we look at other conflicts um, of similar nature in the region, and we see that our allies and partners in Europe and North America, they are very much, and justifiably so, uh, in support of the country whose uh, territorial integrity has been violated. However, we see that somehow over the years, the positions, um, even in the negotiation process, has somewhat um, diverged away from that very important principle of territorial integrity, so much so that we even see hesitation to refer to those very important four UN Security Council resolutions. So uh, this, of course, uh, causes a lot of frustration on the uh, uh, Azerbaijani side. From the Turkish side, on top of this, this region is just next door to us. And our main foreign policy objectives have been and still are to have um, spheres that are areas that are uh, at peace uh, and where we can jointly um, forge um, spaces of um, stability, but also welfare. And the Caucasus has been missing out on that. In fact, Armenia and unfortunately Armenian people has been, have been missing out the most. With uh, Georgia and with our Azerbaijan, we have very good relations. And some of the infrastructure uh, projects that have been realized, um, Armenia has not been able to be in those because of uh, the fact that they have been, unfortunately, have chosen to be the, the problem maker, the, the, the spoiler in the region. We hope that it will be overcome. Now, um, it's difficult. Now going to back to some of your uh, other questions, why Armenia attacked in Tovos in July? It's difficult because as analysts or diplomats, we try to put ourselves in the position of uh, the actor. Um, I think there is some confusion, some different state of mind in in Yerevan, and I you know I should not comment too much on that. But I'm I'm you know I asked one of my colleagues to to outline some of the examples of the discourse coming out of Yerevan. And it's striking and speaks to their um, state of mind, which is not very um, helpful to, to, to us. I see, for example, um, things like this is a clash of civilizations between civilization and barbarism, between good and evil. Um, also talk about the Turkish, uh, Azerbaijani genocidal uh, alliance. And um, if you don't stop them, the Turks will be again at the gates of Vienna. Uh, and uh, even things like um, the, the, the new Hitler in, um, of Asia Minor. Now, um, these discourses, unfortunately, they are from uh, Mr. Pashinyan himself. This could be because he wants to get some sympathy from those who might still um, buy into this sort of discourse. Uh, that's a problem by itself, and so I think it's self-deceptive, self-deceptive, self-deceiving. But uh, in case that he and they believe this, it's even worse. So um, where we find ourselves is, uh, certainly, uh, you know, as Turkey, we want stability in this region, the Caucasus, so that we have good relations with all parties. We want to trade, we want to have exchanges, uh, we have channels of communication and transportation. Uh, that's our vision for the region, but it's it has not been possible because this conflict has been a has been a major um, um, obstacle. We have a saying in Turkish from a lot of this sort of negativity, could something positive emerge? Uh, we are keeping fingers crossed and working towards that. Why, what do I mean by that? What we now need, we believe, is that we need to reinvigorate, revitalize the negotiation process. That has unfortunately not produced much. 
the Kochas, for example, yes, in the past they've done valuable work. Um, we, Turkey is a permanent member of the Minsk group and the co-chairs uh, of the Minsk group have, have done some work indeed in the past, um, but the end result isn't much. Yet, we are proposing to uh, approach the whole negotiation process. After all, negotiations are needed naturally for peace to be lasting. Um, uh, we, we, we want the negotiations to, to restart this time keeping the final settlement always in focus. Because in the absence of that, what has happened is um, this has allowed the Armenian side to evade the final settlement and uh, complicate the, 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 the process uh, and reach no results. And this no results uh, state of affairs has rewarded the occupier. Uh, that has to change, and I, I really believe this will also be in um, in um, in the interest of Armenian uh, Armenian people, uh, so that we have stability uh, in this region. Um, so the actions, the decisions of Yerevan, could be that um, thinking in the um, in the with the mentality that the more they create this or that complication. Um, the more um, the negotiation process will be futile, will be fruitless, and the occupation will continue. I think that's the crux of the matter. I hope we will be able to overcome that. Uh, and there is a lot of moral, political, but very importantly, international law grounds uh, for moving ahead. But at what we need now is something beyond just another uh, fragile ceasefire, something more concrete, result-oriented, and keeping a focus on um, reaching a, a final settlement on the basis of international law. By that, of course, obviously, what is meant was the, were the very clear uh, United Nations Security Council decisions, and on top of it, of course, the uh, OSCE principles. Um, so, I, I am a born optimist, uh, we should uh, continue this way, we should continue, and uh, we hope that common sense will prevail. I think um, these would be my uh, starting points, I'll be happy to answer uh, your questions. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Ambassador, for your contribution. Uh, now I would like to um, move to our third speaker. Uh, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Ambassador um, Matthew Braiza. Uh, Mr. Braiza, you have also served as the um, co-chair of the OSCE Minsk Group in the past, so you have first-hand knowledge of the, the conflict as well as the other speakers. Um, so, I mean, it's quite complicated, one of the old frozen conflicts in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in the former Soviet republics. And we know many actors are involved here. Uh, Russia is one of the uh, one of the leading actors in this region as well. And we know the the role Russia is playing in Armenia. Uh, and um, also, uh, the United States has a stake, I, I think, also in the region. Uh, in this, um, I mean, in the last last uh, eruption of the conflict, we see that Russia is a little bit hesitant. Uh, I mean. In the past, it was forcing uh, both sides to, you know, the uh, accept a ceasefire, and uh, and uh, and it was more involved in the, you know, continuation of the status quo. But now we see a more reluctant Moscow. First, I would like to ask you, why do you think that uh, Moscow is more reluctant nowadays? Mm -hmm. Second, what is U.S. position? We know there are elections in the United States, and uh, nobody is quite really interested what is going on. But still, I mean, uh, obviously, it is important. Um, and the third uh, is uh, uh, we seen that Azerbaijani uh, uh, army has advanced quite a lot. I mean, I think this is the first time they have seized the in initiative in the military field, and uh, they, they have uh, uh, seized the loss of territory back. I mean, maybe ten percent of the Nagorno-Karabakh already, and I think nothing will be same after what happened in the last uh, three or four weeks or so, and, and it, it may continue uh, a little bit more. So what do you think 
this current uh, conflict will bring us i mean that would maybe there is a talk of turkey's involvement in the in the negotiations do you think it's possible or uh, realistic uh, these are my questions to you i hope it's not too much and uh, thank you very much for your contribution oh thanks so much mr Merakli. those are fantastic questions and you know among the best i've been asked uh, throughout all these thank you a few weeks, yeah, and uh, I also like to say that I mean, Ambassador Iskandero, Ambassador Tezel, um, I hope the people who are with us to this evening um, appreciate how how dignified and how restrained their comments were in, a, in a, at a moment of intense emotion, and they have opened the door or or indicated the door for how to. Uh, get through this mess, but we, we can come to that at the end. And let, let me answer your question. So first of all, I agree. Russia has been restrained in a way that has uh, upset many Armenians. And they expect that Russia, as their treaty ally under the Collective Security Treaty Organization, uh, is going to support them all the time. Uh, and I think that was a huge miscalculation by whomever made it, whether it was Prime Minister Pashinyan or whoever else, um, because this conflict is being fought on the territory of Azerbaijan, not of Armenia, but of Azerbaijan. And even the government of Armenia recognizes that fact because Armenia does not recognize the existence uh, in an international legal sense uh, of Nagorno-Karabakh, or as they call it, Artsakh, uh, as uh, uh, a state. So um, I think that, you know, the, the Russia understands that its obligations to come to the assistance of Armenia under the Collective Security Treaty Organization are only valid in the case that Armenian territory is attacked. So this is not Armenian territory. So that's the first reason why President Putin has been uh, restrained. The second reason is, and for anybody who, who is Armenian or loves Armenia, uh, I, you know, I apologize if I offend you, but you know, I, 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 my job for many years was uh, the impartial U.S. mediator of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, so the U.S. co-chair. I, I did that for three years, but before that, on President Bush's staff, for four years, I was thinking through, brainstorming with my colleagues in Armenia and Azerbaijan and many other places, uh, how do we come up with a way to uh, resolve this conflict? And that, and, and you know, together that all became the basic principles. So um, I think that uh, President Putin um, wants to avoid getting Russia involved in the fighting because A, that costs Russian lives and B, because Russia is already deeply embedded in Armenia. Um, you know, anybody who understands what's happening in Armenia knows how profound Russia's influence is. And it's understandable from Armenia's perspective, history has been very complicated and horrible and Russia has been from Armenia's perspective, a protector. Um, but, you know, Russian business interests dominate so much of the Armenian economy. And then Armenian business people, businessmen, oligarchs, are extremely influential in Moscow as well. So there's a symbiotic relationship between Russian political leaders, Armenian business leaders, and therefore <laughs> Armenian politicians. Uh, that, that's one key piece. Mm. Another important piece, second one, I have three, is that if Russia is already so deeply embedded in Armenia, in business, as I just described, or in terms of commanding Armenia's border guards, or given that Russia has a military base, actually two military bases on the territory of Armenia, uh, or that Armenia's uh, airspace is integrated into Russia's airspace, Russia has accomplished <laughs> you know, pretty much all that it can accomplish in Armenia in terms of being dominant. So. If you're, if you're thinking like a CEO of a company, if you want to grow your business, Azerbaijan is where you can grow your business. And Azerbaijan has a lot that's very attractive for growing your business, economically, geostrategically. I mean, Azerbaijan is the only country that shares a common border with both uh, Russia and Iran. And my third point at this point is that I think President Putin is reserved because he... he 
really does not like Prime Minister Pashinyan, not in a personal sense, uh, but because Pashinyan is his greatest fear. Prime Minister Pashinyan is an independent, non-political politician who came to power through popular protests that overthrew the old regime. Again, th think about what President Putin's worried about. That's exactly what he worries about in Russia. You've got protests, the 100th day has just passed uh, of protests against essentially President Putin in in uh, the Far East, in, in uh, Primorsky Krai. Oh no, Kras uh, no, sorry, in, yeah, in uh, Khabarovsk. Um, you've got these demonstrations in Belarus against Lukashenko. Uh, and you had, you know, you've had years of demonstrations against Putin uh, through popular protests on the streets of Moscow. So that's that's the second, or that, that, that that's really the third most important point. So um, I think President Putin is, is sitting back for all those three reasons. The U.S., what's the U.S. approach? Yeah, I agree with you that the U.S. is, is um, not really focused. Um, we're in the middle of a huge election campaign, even though I live in Istanbul, I say we. Um, in, in the context of the COVID pandemic, as well as uh, the Black Lives Matters movement for those in Europe who've been following that, uh, a sense that there's systematic racism in the United States that has to be addressed and defeated. Um, and then you have a uh, presidential candidate in, in Joe Biden who has a history of being uh, finding common ground with Armenian Americans and Greek Americans and Cypriot Americans. And, you know, as an American, that's not bad. That, that's how our democracy works. Um, but that's a factor that, that complicates uh, the, the way forward. Um, so I think that President Trump, I'm, I, I wish, sorry, I wish that President Trump, all things being equal, would recognize that the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is one issue on which he can do what he said during his campaign he hoped he could do, which is improve relations with Russia. You know, we're, we're totally at odds with Russia, even under President Trump, in Ukraine or in Georgia or on the U.S. elections. But on Nagorno-Karabakh, we should be and have been together. And, you know, I, as the Minsk Group co-chair, uh, I'll never forget in 2008 how I was, like, fighting as hard as I could to, against what Russia was doing in Georgia. It invaded Georgia in August 2008. It has subsequently occupied over 20% of its territory. Uh, and I thought it was strategically terrible for my own country. But at the same time, our negotiations together on Nagorno-Karabakh were going well. And I'll never forget a lunch that the then foreign, or foreign minister Lavrov hosted uh, for us, the Minsk Group co-chairs. Uh, and um, he actually served a, a, a Georgian dish. We were supposed to talk about Nagorno-Karabakh, but he served a soup called harcho. And I said, Mr. Foreign Minister, wow, you've just, you know, we've had, you're in the middle of this military conflict with Georgia and you're serving me this soup that is Georgian. Why? And he said, because I want to send a signal that we want to work with the United States and France, the other Minsk Group co-chair, to find a peaceful solution to the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. So I hope that President Trump um, will realize that if he wants to work with President Putin on something, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh may be that key issue, that only issue that is politically palatable in the United States, given domestic U.S. politics. Finally, I'd, li I'd like to comment on how, how we got here. So and the basic principles, which both Ambassador Tezel and Ambassador Iskandarov talked about. The basic principles essentially is a, a collection of not many ideas, a few ideas uh, that allows for the classic solution of a conflict in terms of lands for peace, right? So what it says is that, um, Azerbaijan regains the seven, its seven territories surrounding Nagorno-Karabakh, its seven territories, and displaced Azerbaijani persons, as Ambassador Iskanderov described, return to their homes. And ethnic Armenians can stay. They can stay in Nagorno-Karabakh. And President Aliyev has said this repeatedly uh, in, in recent weeks. The Armenians are welcome to stay. 
uh, you know, from Azerbaijan's perspective, well, the, the, they will be citizens of Azerbaijan, but that gets to the second key element of the basic principles, which is that the final legal status of Nagorno-Karabakh will de be determined at some point in the future, could be the distant future, uh, by a vote of the residents of Nagorno-Karabakh. And in the meantime, Nagorno-Karabakh will achieve an interim legal status. Uh, you know, the, 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 the details of which must be negotiated, but it's an interim legal status. So if you're, if you're uh, on the Armenian side, you should like this, because what that means is an interim legal status is something different than that Nagorno-Karabakh is unambiguously part of Azerbaijan. This is hugely controversial in Azerbaijan, of course. And, and, and the fact that President Aliyev agreed to this in principle, along with then President of Armenia Sarkisyan in January of 2009, says a lot about the Azerbaijani side's desire to resolve this conflict peacefully. But that's not what has happened. Why? Um, because the basic principles are unacceptable uh, in both Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, by the populations in general. By the way, the, the basic principles also contain the, the, the idea that um, the, the security of the ethnic Armenian residents of Nagorno-Karabakh will be, be protected by peacekeepers and also by a, uh, a corridor through the, the, the Azerbaijani district of Lachin from uh, Armenia to Nagorno-Karabakh. So um, we, the co-chairs, thought this was a balanced proposal that uh, fulfills the key OSCE Helsinki Final Act fundamental principles of recognizing the territorial integrity of states, recognizing the right of a people or peoples for self-determination, and recognizing the core principle of not using force and not threatening to use force. So that's what the basic principles say. And as I, as I mentioned, they were agreed by both the leader of Azerbaijan and Armenia in 2009, January. It turned out that they were unacceptable to nationalists in both countries, uh, but that in Armenia, nationalists took action. And they dissuaded then-President Sarkisian from finalizing these basic principles at a landmark meeting that actually I hosted in our ambassador's residence in Prague. Uh, and subsequently, I, then I left my post as Minsk Group co-chair and you know, became then nominated to be ambassador of Azerbaijan and a colleague took over. And then there was the next phase, which is a meeting in Kazan, Russia. And at that point, the basic principles were softened a bit from the Armenian perspective in as much as, whereas before, when I was the co-chair, all seven Azerbaijani territories surrounding Nagorno-Karabakh would be returned to Azerbaijan. At Kazan, it was only five. And Azerbaijan decided in the end, eh, no, we don't like that. And so they didn't agree. And then they're, they're up and back, up and back, uh, repeatedly. Uh, and, and the basic principles never got finalized. So I'm almost done. So this is my last minute. So during the course of the last year and a half, some very strange things happened from my perspective as the former, I had to be impartial mediator, uh, you know, chosen by President Bush himself to do this job, um, that, that really worried me. Uh, because Pre Prime Minister Pashinyan abandoned these balanced principles for a settlement. So um, first in April and May, he and his defense minister last year said, um, we reject this idea of a uh, settlement based on lands for peace. Yeah, it's the same thing, like the, the Palestinian-Israeli peace agreement is supposed to be about land for peace, right? He said, we reject that. And our new formula is new war <laughs> for new peace. Hmm. So they reject the basic fundamental concept of land for peace. And then subsequently, uh, Pre Prime Minister Pashinyan said, uh, I, I reject those basic principles of the Minsk Group that I described before, uh, and that my precondition for res resuming negotiations with Azerbaijan is Azerbaijan must rec recognize the independence of Nagorno-Karabakh. So in other words, Nagorno-Karabakh is an independent country. It's equal legally to Azerbaijan or Armenia, which is not even Armenia's position legally. Uh, and I think President Aliyev just said that's that's totally unacceptable because it's unfair. 
Um, the final legal status of Nagorno-Karabakh should be decided through a negotiation, which means Armenia gives up something to get this independent legal status of Nagorno-Karabakh. Once Prime Minister Pashinyan rejected the whole concept for a balanced solution, uh, I, I think the two sides were poised to go to war. So they, they had their armed clashes uh, on the Azerbaijan-Armenia border in July. They both started uh, moving heavy weapons and armor, artillery to the line of contact, which is in Azerbaijan, but separating Armenian and Azerbaijani forces. And something lit the fuse. I don't know what it was on September 27th, but Pandora's box was open and the war has happened. And my very last point, I'm out of time, but is that the, the military conflict um, has been conducted in a low risk way from Azerbaijan's perspective, relying on precision guided munitions and drones for uh, high resolution and highly accurate targeting. Um, I think that Armenia has no way to stop these attacks. It doesn't have the electronic warfare capabilities and it doesn't have the air defense capabilities. So Azerbaijan has been pushing, pushing step by step to trying high value military targets. And in the last two days, something changed. And I'm still trying to figure out what it is, but Azerbaijani forces pushed very far ahead along the Araxes or Aras River, uh, along the border with Iran. It prompted Iranian civilians on the Iranian side of the border to be, who are ethnically Azerbaijani, to cheer for Azerbaijan moving forward. And, and I heard early this morning that there's been shelling of the, uh, the corridor, the Laching corridor that connects Armenia with Nagorno-Karabakh. So something seems to have broken and changed in the last couple of days to Azerbaijan's advantage militarily. Um, and I think the key is that everybody gets the parties back to the negotiating table as soon as possible on the basis of the Madrid principles or the basic principles that I outlined before for a balanced solution. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Um, I will ask uh, one question for each of the speakers, and I would like to start again with you, um, maybe. Um, you mentioned that the Pashinyan, I mean, strange things happened in, in Armenia, um, but uh, as far as we know that he was a popular leader. Uh, he got overwhelming um, uh, the majority uh, of the votes from the electorate and he was elected as prime minister. Um, and we, if we look at the balance of power, militarily speaking or economically speaking, it has shifted towards Azerbaijan. And it doesn't make sense in my own mind that uh, Ar Armenia uh, starts an attack or, uh, uh, towards Azerbaijan or rejects all these basic principles. That doesn't make sense. I mean, how do you explain this? I mean, the, I mean, it, probably, that's my own uh, analysis, we will see that Pashinyan will lose his seat at the end of this uh, current, uh, I mean, uh, however it may end be, I don't know, but... Uh, even if today's uh, losses for Armenia in terms of equipment, personnel, and the, the land that they were occupying, I mean, it's huge. Uh, uh, I mean, so probably he will lose his seat. So what was the calculation behind this? I mean, I, I don't, I cannot really comprehend. Again, I mean, I'm your... sorry to repeat, but that's a great question. So insightful. And I wish anybody in the hundreds of, of interviews I've done on TV had asked me that question. So I think that... Uh, uh, it, it, a couple of issues or a couple of explanations. Um, one, he knows that he's from outside the system. And so lots of people were cheering for him, e even me, right? To, to win, to, to consolidate his uh, strength and to eliminate the horribly corrupt system that has dominated Armenian politics and life since the collapse of the Soviet Union and even in the Soviet Union. You know, I mean, the, the way Armenian politics works, it, it's, it's, a, it's a combustible mix of extreme nationalists who believe in a greater Armenia, who want to recover territory that is now Turkish, that, that you know well, um, who uh, are, are, are willing to use violence. Uh, and, and then also um, people from the... the uh, Karabakhi clan, as they call it. So Robert Kocharyan and Serge Sarkisyan, who were military commanders from Nagorno-Karabakh during a war, who became the leaders, the presidents of Armenia. 
So they, you know, they don't like Pashinyan. He kicked them out. So they want him to be a hard line, like those extreme nationals, the Dashnak Situn, um, uh, when it comes to Nagorno Karabakh. Uh, and then you've got businessmen, as they say in Russia, <laughs> oligarchs, uh, who are very influential in Moscow and in Yerevan and have deep ties, not just to the political systems in both countries, Russia and Armenia, but to organized crime. So this is a horrible mix of people that made it impossible for Pashinyan to consolidate his strength. And to, to Pashinyan's credit, if you go back to his first meeting with, with President Aliyev in late 2018, after they first time met in Dushanbe, Tajikistan, they both said, um, essentially, we have confidence that we can maybe finalize these basic principles that I talked about, and we need to prepare our citizens for peace, meaning prepare them for the basic principles. Subsequently, I think Pashinyan just was crushed by these, these interests that I just mentioned and never consolidated his political strength. He has no movement. He has no party. He just has 70% of the population of Armenia that loves him, which is great, but he couldn't translate that into a political organization. And so he had to be like, as I, I mean, I'm Polish American, Roman Catholic by birth. We say he had to be more Catholic than the Pope. He had to be more nationalistic than the nationalists. And I think he sold himself out. He sold out his own values to survive. And so that's a Faustian deal and Faust never results in a good outcome for the person that deals with him. And so that's where we are right now. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, contribution. Mm. And now I would like to ask one question to uh, Ambassador Skandaro. Um, we know that there is the, the Minsk group, uh, and um, however, some members of the Minsk group in the recent conflict has, as far as I see, has taken sides in the conflict, uh, especially if I look at the, the, the um, uh, statements from the French side, I see that they are clearly taking sides. And do you think that the Minsk group is still the, the uh, is a mechanism to solve this problem, solve this problem uh, diplomatically? Uh, and do you think also there is this talk, uh, Turkey's participation in the in the in the negotiation process? Do you think also that's an uh, that's an uh, let's say uh, uh, something that Azerbaijan also is uh, is, is is asking for? Uh, first of all, uh, Minsk group itself is is really very uh, important instrument. I don't speak about the coaches, but now about Minsk group and. Our Turkish friends are already on the table, at the mm. table, I'm sorry, already. They are members of Minsk group. Secondary, they are working very hardly on the ground, exceptionally seriously, together with others. Uh, by the way, you maybe heard about uh, so many telephone conversations with other uh, real uh, decision maker, makers, uh, concerning Armenia, that's why that's why I think that it, uh, Turkey is already at the table. Of course, we'd like to have a more active participation of Turkey in this process, not just because of our you know, brotherhood relations, as we call it, you know, two states, one nation. No, not only because of it, because you know, if you speak about the very practical approach, you know. Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, were on the connectivity bottleneck between Europe and Asia. Not only, it's not only energy, you know, it's a the shortest and safest way between Europe and Asia, and we're working together as a, I don't want twin, or, uh, twin sisters, twin, twin brothers with our Turkish friends, brothers, our, our uh, Georgian friends. It's, it's crucial and, to understand it, because uh, without Turkey, uh, the, the stability in the region is not visible at all. And from this point of view, of course, we want to have a more active engagement of Turkey. And concerning the, you know, uh, you just mentioned France, in the beginning they did have some kind of the, uh, in, in some kind of interventions, uh, and mostly connected again to our brotherhood country, Turkey. I understand this, uh, that it was, you know, we can assess it on two ways, on real politics or on emotions. 
you know, I think in emotions, the, you know, if you are going to emotions, it's not a policy at all. We should work <laughs> as, a, as a real pragmatic politicians. In this case, if, for example, France has total on, on, as one of the main uh, you know, uh, investors to the new exploration field in Caspian Sea, and, uh, or uh, in other ones, so many. So you should be a little bit more pragmatic. And we see it now, they have a much more neutral position. Uh, that's why uh, there are so many rumors about the possibility to change their co-chairs, well, you know, for example, European Union could be instead of France. But in case of the decision-making process in European Union, it's a consensus. I can't imagine. I can't imagine that, for example, to be some kind of the decision was 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 Cyprus in the on the board of EU concerning the <coughs> real objective decision of our uh, of, of this conflict, because of you know the position of Cyprus, the last resolution of the uh, Parliament. So that's why you know we we work we we used to work. I would like to express my gratitude to. Uh, my dear friend, uh, Mr. Breiser, Ambassador Breiser, met you. Because during his activity as a co-chair, we managed to have these basic, ba basic principles. And also uh, uh, Ambassador Tezel, because it, was, it happened in this period of time, we managed to have it. And then something happened. And you know, that's, it, it, so it means that we can work with this format. It, and it could, but just what, the only one thing which we need to implement what we agreed already. To have a substantive negotiations, not just a negotiations to keep the status quo. Substantive negotiations, result-oriented negotiations, and that's all. Doesn't matter with whom we are working, who are mediators. If you want to find the peace solution, peaceful solution, you definitely will find it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, now I would like to ask also one question to um, and Mr. Tezel. Um, I also asked uh, uh, Mr. Bariza about the uh, calculation behind, uh, behind this decision of uh, Pashinyan uh, to um, uh, attack Azerbaijan, if I may say so. I mean, uh, what do you think also? What is your understanding? I mean, what is going on in Erevan? I mean, why has uh, Pashinyan taken these decisions in the last couple of uh, months? And then the, we see this now the eruption of the, uh, the a new conflict in the region. And the second one also is, is involvement of Turkey in, uh, uh, in this uh, process. I mean, uh, what do you think, what will bring this to? Uh, because from my point of view, I mean, we see that uh, Russia is, is looks impartial, but taking more like inclined to take the part of the Armenia. If you look at the, 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 the relations with the Armenia, the... The, the weapons, uh, you know, aid to Armenia and the, the, also the, the Russian um, bases in, in military bases there and etc. And the France, the current statements, uh, maybe in the past they were more impartial, they, uh, however. So it looks to me that that's, just not, that's not unfair. That's also the, the uh, let's say, um, the feeling in Turkey. Somehow Azerbaijan is left alone. Uh, in this process, and do you think that's also uh, uh, that will help uh, the, to, to solve the problem? Well, starting from the last, obviously Azerbaijan is not alone, mm. uh, and um, I should not comment too much about um, as as a diplomat, as a uh, civil servant, too much about uh, the head of government of another country. Um, but as I said in my opening comments, there's a problem with the decision-making process and uh, the perceptions I feel uh, in, in uh, Yerevan. I've heard commentaries, read commentaries um, of different sorts, uh, but it's, it's for the Armenian people uh, really to, to decide uh, on the performance of their leaders. Uh, the it's been repeated, but I think it, it's, it's really important. The Minsk process, as, uh, as it was also uh, clarified, um, itself is not the problem, I think. 
Uh, yes, uh, you can you know talk about the co-chairs' performance, uh, not individuals, but over the years. Perhaps this happens in international uh, organizations and initiatives. A path dependency um, develops eventually, a certain inertia. And in this sense, the inertia was not pro-peace or pro-solution, rather. Uh, so we really need to set uh, the negotiation uh, back on track. That's, that's uh, for sure. And this time, as the ambassador said, uh, Iskandarov said, it, a real negotiation. It's not a talk shop. It's, with palpable uh, ideas and uh, I was also I had forgotten that Ambassador Breza uh, was uh, co-chairing when these very useful ideas came out in, you know, in this period I think uh, Ambassador you were uh, co-chair between 2005 2009 uh, maybe around that time I just checked uh, indeed uh, these are important ideas basic principles and uh, you know things have changed on the ground somewhat especially recently but the thrust of I, those ideas uh, will are, are still maybe can lead us forward. That's that's what we are ready to do. Um, the co-chairs, well, two of them are allies, and uh, another one is a partner that we, we work with. Uh, so I, I shall not comment about them. Um, the, the, not the Minsk group itself, but as I said, how it has developed uh, perhaps is the problem and. We can, uh, maybe some have said, get back to s factory settings or rather a reset so that we can move forward. And the friends of Armenia too can help Armenia and Armenian government understand this in the end will be in their favor too. Uh, indeed, this region has missed out the whole generation, we're talking about 30 years, which you know makes up a generation, really, you can say. We shouldn't, we shouldn't, they shouldn't miss another 30 years. And uh, if, if there's a missing link, unfortunately, that's Armenia. And you know, they too deserve to benefit from the fruits of cooperation that we can uh, establish here. Um, now, when you go into the details, there are different actors affecting Armenian decision-making, and understandably so. It is true for uh, other countries as well. But the diaspora, I don't think, has been very uh, uh, very helpful in this respect. It seems they have contributed to intransigence in Yerevan over the years. Um, and that's, uh, that's been very unhelpful. Um, so we should keep that in mind. Looking at what's been happening on the ground recently, I should also say that the attacks from Armenia, Armenia proper, into Azerbaijan's territories, which have nothing to do with the conflict, are telling. And the fact that civilian targets uh, have been hit is something, in the first few days, escaped the attention somehow, um, some uh, there were some blind eyes turned on that in that respect, but now increasingly that's being recognized. These are serious violations of humanitarian law. Uh, if you remember, was it two years ago when the Armenian defense minister had mentioned about the possibility of attacking the Mingachever Dam, the hydroelectric power plant, which has happened? Thankfully, you know, uh, I think uh, it wasn't, uh, didn't uh, create a big, big um, damage or catastrophe it could have. But, and Ganja, the, the second bis biggest city, the, the, the shells the other day fell, you know, and killed people who were burying their dead in, in the graveyard. Um, I mean, if not now, when is the time to talk about the, um, you know, the, the, the war crimes or violations, uh, flagrant violations of international humanitarian law on the part of uh, Armenia, if not now, when? Uh, so that also creates a perception of double standards and grievances on the part of Armenia and others, and uh, which infuri infuriates them, and we, we which we understand. But the the way the negotiations and the discourse coming out of mediation developed over the years is also uh, unfair in the following way. The notion of 
impartiality that what you that's what you expect from uh, yeah, mediators that impartiality should not mean does not mean and should not mean being equidistant whatever the parties do just stay in the middle that that doesn't work that's not healthy impartiality and impartiality is a um, is a commitment of the co-chairs but you know not only the co-chairs quite a few countries they think in very conventional terms and they say oh there is fighting and i'll just stay in the middle i'll be equidistant to both parties that rewards the aggressor the um the the occupier and it's it, it penalizes the 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 party which is wrong uh, the victim so that's been one of the problems we hope that um we can overcome that and there are some signs of it as turkey we will be ready to to contribute as much as we can as i said this is in our national interest had azerbaijan been another country based on our understanding of international law and our preference for stability in our region we would still um on the side be on the side of that actor which has been occupied and uh, uh which because simply because that constitutes the uh, the, the 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 essence of the problem and as i said in the beginning now is the time to focus on the final settlement the the the, the a viable settlement um, which has to and there is no alternative to uh, to it and the occupation all these basic ideas the UN Security Council decisions took that as a basis. Now you can talk about the mm, modalities of that, but that has to happen. There is no alternative and we will do a good service to the whole region, including Armenians, if we, uh, uh, we somehow get, uh, uh, get the Armenian government to think also along these lines. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. There is one last question, um, and uh, that is about uh, um, the role of uh, Iran in this conflict. And one of our viewers, uh, he or she asks, uh, why does Iran support Armenia? And why the U.S. canceled its uh, arms embargo? And I would like to direct this question to uh, Mr. Breiza. Um, Sure. Well, oh, yeah, I, I, I thought I lost you for a second. Um, so the government, yeah, <laughs> the government of Armenia, I think, has been supportive. I mean, the government of Iran has been supportive of Armenia for basically the reason of countering the United States and the EU in partnering with Azerbaijan on not only exports of oil and gas to the European Union space, but in general to to helping Azerbaijan connect with Georgia to Turkey and then onward to the EU in in a strategic sense. Um, and that's been going on since President Bill Clinton's administration since the mid 1990s. I mean, that's been the US policy. That, that's how I got involved in this whole region in the first place, in fact, was by being you know one of the two people on President Clinton's staff who was working with Turkey and Georgia and Azerbaijan to develop uh, a network of oil and gas pipelines that gave Azerbaijan uh, some breathing space from Russia's uh, attempt to monopolize export routes. Um, so Iran didn't like that. Um, but now what we're seeing is that, it, particularly in Northern Iran, well, back up, Iran, you know, like one fifth of its population is ethnically Azerbaijani, right? As many people on this, uh, call no, and the supreme leader is Azerbaijani. Rafsanjani was Azerbaijani. Many, many uh, Iranians in northern Iran are Azerbaijani. I mean, it's called South Azerbaijan and East and West Azerbaijan, right? Tabriz is an Azerbaijani city. And so during the course of these last few weeks, um, there have been protests across northern Iran demanding that the government changes its policy and stops, in fact, closes the border with Armenia. Right. So to help Azerbaijan. And if you, you know, there's so much video now out there on, on Twitter and elsewhere of um, ethnic Azerbaijanis in Iran uh, chanting that Karabakh is, is Azerbaijani. And then there was, I mean, compelling video yesterday of Azerbaijani troops advancing along, as I was saying before, the Ara Araxis River 
uh, in the border with, with, with Iran and Iranians causing a traffic jam, <laughs> getting out of the cars and, and chanting the same thing, you know, Azerbaijan and Karabakh is Azerbaijani. So I think that this whole issue is a, a domestic political one uh, in, in Iran right now that is potentially creating instability. Um, I'll bet, I don't know, but I'll bet that people in Washington are wondering, is there a way to exploit that? And I hope they're not, uh, because this, this conflict needs to be brought to a conclusion on the basis of what both Ambassador Iskandarov and Ambassador Tezel were saying, the basic principles. It's the, we've tried so many other formulas. This is the one fair formula for both sides. And Azerbaijan has, has been succeeding on the battlefield. It's changing the political map. There are new realities out there that will allow Azerbaijan to enter into these negotiations from a position of strength. I, I can imagine from the Armenian perspective that seems unfair, but you know, for all these last 30 years, the, the table has been turned. And because Armenia was so successful militarily with Soviet help, at a moment when Azerbaijan was in, in great political peril and weakness, uh, you know, Armenia was able to occupy these regions. So, you know, karma, political karma has returned. Um, and so, 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 so I, I just hope that the Iran angle won't become really predominant in this and that all of us in the international community will focus on a balanced, a fair, and a final resolution of this conflict, which is available and was preliminarily agreed in January 2009 by the leaders of both Armenia and Azerbaijan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we had a fruitful uh, discussion and I would like to thank uh, all of you for your participation and contribution. contribution. Uh, Mr. Ambassador uh, Matthew Braiza uh, and Mr. Ambassador Yunit Can Tezel and uh, Mr. Ambassador Fuat Iskandarov. Thank you very much uh, for your time and uh, for your uh, contribution. And I would like to uh, thank also all our viewers for their participation and hope to see you again in our uh, future events. Thank you. Thank you.